you, Jesus. Why don't you lift your hands all over this place? Those of you watching at home, just lift your hands to heaven. For what purpose, Pastor Mike? To thank and praise him that he's always been by your side. He's never left you alone. He's always been your comfort. He's been your peace. He's been your provider. He's been your healer. He's been your savior. He's been your deliverer. He's been everything you've needed him to be. Come on, lift your hands and just thank him for who he is today. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. Somebody watching this right now, you need to hear that word because the enemy's tried to crowd in on you to make you to feel like nobody cares. God doesn't care that you're all alone. But here, I want you to know today, he's with you. He's not only in this sanctuary, but he's with you. He's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere all the time. He's right there in your living room, your bedroom, your kitchen, your family room. He's there with you right now. And he's always been there. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you today. We love you this morning. We thank you, God, that we could come to you humbly with gratitude and thanksgiving in our hearts for your faithful Lord. You're faithful Lord. You're a faithful God always by our side always there aren't you grateful for the presence of the Lord amen in your life not just when you come in the house of God to worship but continually you can count on God's presence tomorrow and you know what you can count on his presence when you don't feel him when you don't feel on the mountaintop he's always there he said he'd never leave us, never leave us, never, never leave us. Come on, give the Lord praise in this place and at home right now. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Oh, my goodness. His presence in this place. So awesome. So awesome. We're going to continue in our series uh, today I've been debating about what to do and which way to go I've got a message burning on my heart about how to be a leader in times of crisis a passage of scripture that I came across is just power packed I've got that in the wings um, I was just asked this past week by the general executive committee to prepare a message about racism in our nation uh, as one of 26 pastors and leaders uh, around the world out of thousands so I'm very humbled and honored for that so I'll be preaching that to you at some point but this essential holiness man I just can't walk away from that too soon we gotta we gotta dig in there today there's there's more that God wants to speak to us out of that and I'm going to go back, you know, a couple weeks ago to the text, the original text, Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That sounds pretty essential to me. There are a lot of things through the crisis and the pandemic and the unrest, and we're going to pray for all of that in just a moment before I speak to you the word of God. All of those things kind of bring a sifting in our lives, a prioritization in our lives where the non-essential gets sifted like wheat does away from the essential, the purposeful, the meaningful. Letting go of the peripheral so that what is really important remains. Okay? Holiness got to have it and what I want to talk to you today about is why does God want us to be holy why there's some specific reasons for that so I want you to join me in prayer and when we did while we do when we pray you know there's a lot happening in our world right a lot going on and the racial tension in America let me just say this to you just recently, you know, we, we, we came through the Democratic National Convention, and then after that, the Republican National Convention. 
And I don't know what you got out of that, even if you watched it or even if you got snippets of it or highlights from it. Here's my takeaway from those two conventions. Politics is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. That's what I know for a fact. Jesus is the answer. And so we've got to walk at this time humbly before God in repentance, a spirit of brokenness and humility, and a prayer for unity. Not only in the world, in the body of Christ. You know, we got to get things right in the house of God. You know, the Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. We got to get things right in our hearts first. Before we ask God to send unity in our nation, send it here. Before we ask God to send revival in our nation, send it here. Right? Refreshing, renewal, great awakening. God, awaken me right here. Let it start in my real estate. Let it start right here in my world. Let me be on fire. Let me be full of power. Let me be full of refreshing and renewal. Because that's how it works. And then when we all get there, man, then it's ignition time. Amen? So let's pray. Those of you at home, come on. Let's lift our voices to God in prayer. Father, we come humbly before you in a spirit of repentance and humility with gratitude and thankfulness that we know that you're with us. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. But you'll go with us all the way, even to the end of the world. Lord, we bow humbly in prayer today, thanking you, God, that we can even come to you in prayer, that Jesus made a way. Jesus made a way where there was no way. And Lord, today we ask humbly that you would continue to minister during this service time. Touch people, God, not only in this sanctuary, but those watching at home. The many people that are watching from across the nation, around the world. God, minister your power and presence into their lives. Lord, you know what we have need of. You know, God, what our lives are desperately in need of. So God, we ask you to administer that to us today. We pray the power and the touch of God. Oh, hear, hear this prayer, Lord. The touch of God would be upon our lives. Come on, somebody get into that right now. Somebody tap into that. You need God's touch. You need the touch of the master's hand today. That touch can change everything. God, we need your touch, your presence. So fill every living room, every apartment, every home every vehicle, every, every place where people are watching right now and where people will be watching all week. I pray that God, the power of heaven, would just saturate them and minister to them. God, your deliverance, your power, your anointing, your healing, God, your forgiveness right now, wherever they are. And in this building, God, saturate us today. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. And God, we pray heal our land heal our land God Father you're the answer Holy Spirit you're the answer Jesus you paid the price to be the answer so Lord we look to you we don't look the Bible says in the book of Psalms some trust in chariots some in horses but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God we trust not in man, but we trust in you. You are our confidence. And so, Lord, send revival to us personally. God, anything in us that is not godly, let it be gone. We repent of it. We ask you to cleanse us, forgive us for all sin, iniquity, transgression. Everything, God, that would violate the holiness of God. Lord, let it be eradicated and removed from our lives, from us corporately as believers. That, God, we may be good hosts of your presence. Your presence would always, always fill. And, God, whatever you're doing in this season right now, we want to go. We want to go to the next level. Teach us what to do. Teach us, God. We don't act proudly that we've been this way before and we know it. God, you take us on the journey. Let us be spirit-led as a people. So God, take this word. Do what you want to do with it and above everything, everything. May the name of Jesus Christ be lifted high and exalted 
for it's in his holy name we pray and let everybody say amen amen all right before you're seated you got to turn around and give somebody an air five an air high five all right those of you at home we welcome you god bless you you may be seated listen a couple things real quick life groups get connected to a life group you got to do that this is so important i'm going to just say this to you it's not just a kind suggestion you know prior to the pandemic it's just like we we really want you in a life group why is it important to be connected to other believers in a life group well for fellowship for pastoral care so that people are looking out for one another for discipleship you can't grow unless you're bouncing things off of one another iron sharpens iron okay you've got to get connected with other believers you say well I don't need it well they need it they need you let's place you in a place of importance Okay? Somebody needs your experience, your wisdom, the travels you've had, the life you've been through, the faith you exhibit. Somebody needs you. So you need to get connected to a life group. And I'm going to go beyond that. I want you to understand that to be a member of Life Source, you have to be connected to a small group. We've never made that an issue before, but I'm making it, I'm making that paramount. If you, you can attend here, you can, but if you want to be a member, you got to be part of a life group. Why? Because if something like this, okay, if they, if, if this has happened once, it can happen again. And the enemy's purpose in it is to divide, scatter, okay? The church of the living God in this, in this particular arena has to be connected in small group life so that people are cared for and nurtured and none drops through the cracks. Did you know that a recent Barna study says that 32% of the American church, people that were regular attenders, people that were involved before the pandemic have totally dropped off the map. They're gone, 32%. We got to stay connected in the body of Christ, okay? So this is, this is serious business, folks. So want you to get connected. Get connected to a life group, okay? During the week, we have Zoom Bible studies. Get connected to that. By the way, those of you at home, more and more people are coming back every week. We thank God for that. You might be wondering, when should I come back? Let me tell you the best time to come back. September the 20th is National Back to Church Sunday. Every, every year in September, there's a National Back to Church Sunday. This year, it means more, I think, than ever before. So if you've been waiting, you've been wondering, September the 20th is your day to venture out. Let me read something before I get into the message. It's this week's one-year Bible reading coming up, and I, this is part of the Zoom Bible study that I teach on this week, but I'm gonna just read this this passage to you. This is out of the New Living Translation book of Isaiah. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 8. Listen to what the Lord says to Isaiah. Verse 11. New Living Translation. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do and don't live in dread of what frightens them. I thought, now, if that's not a now word, don't live in dread of what frightens them. This world is frightened. This world is living in fear because of the coronavirus. I'm not saying throw all caution to the wind. I think you need to be cautious, and I see you wearing masks today, and I wore mine up until the time I got up here to preach. And I wear mine every time I go out. But you know what? I am not going to walk in fear. Can I tell you what? The same God that heals cancer, the same God that heals the flu, the same God that heals liver disease and heart disease, somehow the coronavirus isn't bigger than all that and not bigger than God. So we are counseled not to live in dread like everybody else does. Why? Because of what we just sang. He's with us. He comforts us. He's always there. Amen? 
So listen, that's a great word. And let me just go on to say, because this kind of segues into the message. Verse 13 says, make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. What does that mean? Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Things that are holy you don't treat as common. So that means the Lord deserves a special place in your lives. Not like everything else. Not like everybody else. He is separate, holy, apart from everything that's common. Treat him that way and let him be God in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So we're back to the question, why does the Lord want us to be holy? Well, can I tell you from just an overarching big theme We are to be God's kingdom representatives in the earth. We're to represent the kingdom. And if there's any time that this world needs the kingdom and the king, it's now. It's now. And the church needs to walk right now in the power of God. Because there's a pandemic going on that's driving this world crazy, dividing our nation. There's racial tension in our inner cities and across the nation. This world is in a mess. And it needs the power of God. And you and I are kingdom representatives to display the power of God. The power of God's love, the power of God's healing, the power of God's reconciliation. We're called to be ministers, according to Paul, ministers of reconciliation to God and reconciliation to one another. We're called as ministers for that. So if that power is going to be displayed, listen to me, hear this, very important. Power is rooted in holiness. Get that, please. Power is rooted in in holiness. No holiness, no power. No holiness, no life change. It's so critical. So I want to give you, uh, beyond that foundation, three critical reasons why the Lord wants us to be holy. Three critical reasons. Number one, because he wants us to make a difference in the lives of others. And you can't make a difference in the lives of others powerfully and effectively in a kingdom purpose without being holy. Let me give you a verse. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. It says, For the unbelieving husband is made holy through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So what this is telling us is that if you are in a home with unbelievers, your presence there, you hear what I'm saying? Your presence there makes a difference, changes the atmosphere, causes the unbelieving that you're connected and associated to to be holy. Say this after me. And those of you at home, say it out loud. My children are holy. I'm so glad you said that because I didn't hear my children are demons. We don't want that. You've got to pronounce the goodness of God over your offspring. My children are holy. My grandchildren are holy. My great-grandchildren are going to be holy. This is their heritage. Why? Because why? I am holy. That's not arrogance. That's not boastful. That's a command from God. I told you several weeks ago about that. Be holy for I am holy. By the way, this is essential holiness part three. David preached part two last week. Right? Amazing message. Essential holiness. Now let me help you to understand how important your life is. 
to be lived in front of others because you make a difference. We have biblical examples of that. Moses in Exodus 32. When Moses is removed from the scene in Exodus 32, he goes up to the mountain to receive the commands of God. The people corrupt themselves. They totally go off the rails. Why? Because Moses is absent. Remove him from the equation and all hell breaks loose. Let me give you some other examples. Joshua, in, Joshua, in Judges 2.7, it says, The people worshiped the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. But you know what? The commentary after this is, but there rose a generation that did not know the works of God. So as long as Joshua was on the scene and the leaders that he had raised up, the people of Israel walked in the straight way that they were to go. They got removed. They passed on. They, they died. Then the nation went nuts. Jehoiada, the priest, in 2 Chronicles 24, Jehoiada was a priest alongside of Joash. Remember, Joash was a boy. He was eight years old when he was raised up to be king. And Jehoiada was a priest and influenced him and influenced the nation greatly. And in 2 Chronicles 24, the Bible tells us that people served the Lord while Jehoiada was the priest. As long as he was alive, they served the Lord. But after his death, they became unfaithful. Now, I've given you three examples. Let me give you one last example of people who make a huge difference in the world. You. You. Who, me? Yeah, you. You're talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. You make a big difference. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's talking to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Jesus calls disciples, not only those that are currently there, but us as well. He tells them, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Now in John 1, the Bible says he's the light of the world, right? But now his light lives in us. Now we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Here's the deal, folks. Remove you out of the equation who knows the path things are going to take? I have seen even people in this church. I've watched families. I'm thinking of one particular family right now. And there was an individual who was like, the, they were the backbone of that family. That person died, went on to be with the Lord, and the, I mean, extensive family network, all of them crumbled, just fell away, fell apart. They don't come to this day. It was nothing about the church. It was nothing about me, nothing about me. It was all about that person that made a difference. You make a difference. Don't, don't downplay that. The enemy would want to downplay that. The enemy wants you to feel insignificant, like I prayed earlier, right after the last worship song, wants you to feel alone. There's somebody out there watching today. The enemy wants you to feel alone. Not, you're not worthy. You're, you don't make a difference. Nobody cares. I'm here to tell you, you matter to God and you matter to God's people. You hang in there. God has a plan and a purpose for your life and you matter. Here's the thing, though. I want to, how many of you want to make a bigger difference? I want to make a bigger difference. I want to make an impact while I'm here on this earth. I want lives to be changed because I was here. I want people's lives to be better because I was here. I want somebody to get in touch with God because I was on this planet. I want somebody to get delivered of heroin and drug addiction and alcoholism because I preached the gospel and I had power in my life. I want somebody's life to go on a different trajectory because I happen to be in their lives to some degree. Don't you want that as well? Come on, folks. We need to make a difference in the earth. We need to be holy because he wants us to make a difference in the lives of others. 2 Timothy 1.5. Love this passage. 
I am reminded, Paul said to Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. See, that goes back to Paul talking to the Corinthians about the family impact. The unbeliever's holy because you're there. You're connected. You see, whatever you're, it's called, it's a principle of association. I've preached this through the years. Whatever you're connected to affects you. And simply because Timothy had a godly grandmother and a godly mother, what was in them became his spiritual inheritance. Can I tell you that when your ancestors die, there are things that don't die with them. There are mantles that are meant to be taken up. There's anointing that's meant to be captured. There's blessing that's meant to be obtained. Don't let it die with your fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers. You're to walk in that. Oh, Jesus. Listen, they, they paved the way. They paid the price. They sacrificed. Don't let that all be in vain and you go some other pathway. They have paved the way. You walk in it. Now, you'll forge in your own pathway, sure, but that creates a foundation for godliness, goodliness, blessing, increase in your life that you can walk in. People are generationally blessed. Don't miss out on that. And that all leads us to this principle in this regard. The absence of holiness creates a vacuum for evil. Don't miss that. And that's revealed in the scriptures that I just shared with you. All right, number two. I've got three of them. Number two. The reason why God wants us to be holy is because he wants to use us more fully. He wants to use us more fully. 2 Timothy 2, verse 20. In a large house there are utensils not only of gold and silver but also of wood and clay, some for special use, some for ordinary. All who cleanse themselves of the things I've mentioned will become special utensils dedicated, useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. Verse 22, shun youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. What is Paul teaching here? He's saying, hey, there, there in a house, there are special utensils for a special purpose. And those that will cleanse themselves, purify themselves, he's talking about that pathway to holiness, they will be able to be used for that special purpose. Now, over here on this table today are some really special utensils. These goblets... These aren't glasses, these are goblets. <laughs> this belongs to Pastor Becky. <clears throat> I was able to sneak them out of the house this morning because she's not here. She's out of state right now, she's fine doing well, but I, I was able to get them. She doesn't know that they're here, but she's watching right now, and right now she's, grab, she's grabbing the side of her head, there's no question. <laughs> so when I put these in the car, I put this on one part of the back seat. I put this in the other part of the back seat. I put these in the trunk, one on one side and one on the other, so nothing would clash, okay? Isn't that beautiful? Wow, it's a sugar bowl, okay? Goldware, right? Ladle, serving spoon. serving dish. This, we've got a whole set of these, okay? This is uh, a special <laughs> china. It's a pompadour china, moss rose uh, pattern. My mother-in-law, Pastor Becky's mom, bought this set in Germany 60 years ago, when she was there serving with my father-in-law as uh, the 
the original founders of the European Theological Seminary, <clears throat> where my wife was born in Germany. So we've had this for a very long time. Pastor Becky, so you'll see that. We bring these out on special occasions. They come out at Thanksgiving. They come out at uh, Christmas, Christmas dinner. We like using this. Now, this is, this, is, this is ours. We bought this. This is where the T goes in this picture. And uh, you can't see it, but inscribed here is the McDermott's, inscribed in the glass. Okay? I mean, this is very fragile, and we bring these out on very special occasions. It makes you feel important. You know, we set the table, okay? We got, we got all the china out. Everybody's got a place setting, you know. No flimsy paper napkins. We got the cloth deal, you know, all of that. Really special. You don't throw this stuff in the dishwasher. You know, you wash these by hand, make sure everything's done right. Now, here's... This is for tomorrow, <laughs> Labor Day, okay? I just threw these in the car. The cup, the paper napkin, the plates, right? Who gives a rip? I mean, you just throw them out, doesn't matter. Plasticware, right? This is every day, and this is one-time use, right? I used one of these yesterday when I cut up an apple on my paper plate. When I was finished with it, I just threw it in the garbage, I mean, it's just, it go, it's, it's gone, right? Throw these out. This, 60 years. So if you want to last, if you want to be used again and again and again, if you want to be repurposed and reused by God over and over and over again, then you prepare yourself according to 2 Timothy 2. You prepare yourself accordingly. The reason some people are paper plates and cups is because there's no preparedness in their lives at all. There's no seriousness in, in their lives at all. There's no intentionality in their lives at all. There's no desire in their lives at all. But if you want to be used by God, you want to make a difference in people's lives, then you're going to have to become a special utensil. You're going to have to become a special. These are gold Plated. This isn't like plastic wear here. This is the real deal here. This is, this is precious. Notice how we treat it differently. And can I tell you something? The reason we treat it differently is because it treats us differently. We feel like kings and queens when we sit down with this. And Paul told Timothy, in a, in a house, we have this in the house, we have this in the house. You have different utensils in the house for different purposes. But if you want this, Timothy said, you've got to cleanse yourselves of the things that I've told you. You've got to remove from you. See, the difference here is that people don't remove things from their lives they ought to remove. They don't take away the things that everybody else is comfortable with. Can I tell you something? If you're going to be used by God, you're going to have to be uncomfortable with some things. You're going to have to say no to some things. You're going to have to realize that isn't for me. Somebody else can do it. A man of God may ascribe to it, but you know in your heart and your spirit, you can't do what they're doing. You can't talk like they talk. You can't let cuss words just come out of your mouth indiscriminately. You can't think, watch, see things other people see. You've got to claim yourselves and remove the stuff that is going to pollute your inner spirit. You've got to keep it pure, clean, your heart, your soul, your spirit, your mind. And by the way, don't, don't misconstrue this analogy here. This is used on special occasions infrequently, two times, three times a year. But when you translate that into the kingdom... Every day is a special day. Every day is a kingdom day. Every day is an opportunity to make a difference in somebody else's life. So this needs to be every day. This needs to be every day. Useful vessel. 
Special purpose, not common. Are you getting what I'm saying? And here is the point in all of this. Your degree of preparedness will determine your degree of usefulness. If you're praying, God, use me. God, use me. God, I want to be used by you. I want to reach other people. I want to be a blessing in the earth. Then that's going to be determined by your preparedness. Are you preparing yourself for that? Are you preparing yourself to walk in that? Spiritually, I mean, come on, folks. It's like David, Pastor David preached last week. It's the stuff that nobody sees. By the way, let me move on to that part. Last point, number three. Why does God want us to be holy? Because he wants us to be like him. Plain and simple. Remember the scripture I gave you a couple weeks ago? It was this. God said, be holy because I'm holy. I want you to be holy because that's what I am. He wants us to be like him. Now, some of this you've heard me preach before, but I'm going to just give it to you because some of you have never heard it, okay? But I'm going to mix in some fresh revelation in this. If you want to be the most like God, you have to walk in love and walk in holiness. I thought about the verses in the Bible that says God is. What is God? God is what? God is love and God is holy. If you want to be most like him, you walk in those two things. Okay? Everything is about identity. Pastor David said that toward the end of his message last week. Everything is about identity. And everything is about identity from God's perspective and from Satan's perspective. And I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. Remember Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. I've taught you over the years about these two words, image and likeness. Okay? Image and likeness. You are made in God's image and also God's likeness. What does that mean? That means image means we look like him. Likeness means we act like him. You can look like somebody but not act like them. How many parents have kids that look a lot like them but they're nothing like them? They have the image but not the likeness. God is not satisfied with you just having the image. He wants you to have his likeness. Okay? Now, let me show you this from a a couple different people's viewpoint. Let's first of all look at Satan, okay? What was Satan's original name? Lucifer. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Some people ascribe this to, some scholars ascribe this to an earthly king. Some ascribe this to Lucifer. But for our purposes, we're going to talk about Lucifer for a minute. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How are you fallen from heaven, O day star? Day star in the original Hebrew is Lucifer. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly on the heights of Zephon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. Watch this next phrase. I will make myself like the most high. I'm going to do it. See, Satan... Lucifer fell from heaven because of his pride. And he said, I'm going to make myself. You don't make yourself. God makes you holy. God makes you like him. You don't have it in yourself. Angels, demons, they don't have it in them. No creation has it in themselves. God alone is sovereign. God is creator. God is the one who makes us holy. Here's his downfall. I'm going to make myself. I'm going to send. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make myself this way. I'm going to become this. Ah, no, 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 no. I get real nervous when I hear people start talking about, I'm this, I'm that. I'm, th-. I'm like, oh. Stay humble, man. Stay humble. Mike, stay humble. God, help me. Stay humble. Walk in humility, Mike. Stay humble. When you hear other people, preachers, everybody, stay humble. Stay humble. Stay humble. You don't make yourself anything. God makes you that way, okay? Everything is about identity. Lucifer 
was his name in the beginning. But he fell from heaven because of his pride. He went through a name change. Watch this. He went through a name change from Lucifer to Satan. Lucifer, what did that mean? Day star, son of the morning. But what does Satan mean? Satan, I'm going to show you this in a minute. Satan means opponent, adversary, accuser. He went from morning star. You see how far, how far he's fallen? There are numerous people in the Bible that have name changes. It denotes a shift in character, a, a level of anointing reached. It's an ascension. The name change for Lucifer was a descension. He went the other way. Luke 10, 17, the Bible says a 70, Jesus sent them out to do his works. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even demons are subject to us. He said to them, I watch Satan, opponent, adversary, accuser, fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over the, all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Satan lost all that. Lucifer lost all that. Let me show you this in the Old Testament. Saul, 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. You know what? Let me just pause. Time is running. I, 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 I'm going to encourage you to write this down and read this. 1 Samuel 10, read verses 1 through 11. This is where Samuel anoints him. Okay, comes to him to be king anoints him, and he tells him, pours a flask of oil on his head, and he tells him everything that's getting ready to happen that day, kind of to give him an encouragement, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to walk down here, you're going to meet this, and in that whole thing, he says, now you're going to meet a company of prophets, and when you meet them, you're going to prophesy, and in that whole interaction, and then after that, as Saul goes, you know what happens? Of everything Samuel said. He comes to a company prophet. He begins to prophesy. And when he walks away, the Bible says his heart, he was turned into another man. God changed him. God changed him completely. And can I tell you, this is why God wants us to walk in holiness so that we can be changed. The people around Saul said, is this Saul? They didn't even recognize him. He was unrecognizable to them because of the change God brought in his life. God, oh, Jesus, help us. God wants us to be so changed and so transformed and the church to be that way so that people go, is that Mike? Is that Pastor Mike? What happened to him? That's what they were saying about, so what happened to him? Oh, come on, folks. The church needs a what happened to them moment. We've got to get out of this sloppiness. We've got to get out of this place of lethargy and everything's just hunky dory and everything's okay and we don't care and we think we can live this way and God's going to smile. That time has come to a conclusion. God wants the church of the living God to rise up in the power of the Spirit and make a difference in this earth. You can read that. I'll do that in the second service. I don't have time now. Luke 4. It's the temptation of Jesus. Two of the three temptations begin with these words out of Satan's mouth to Jesus. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Luke chapter 4. You see, Satan was messing with Jesus' identity. Remember I told you it's all about identity. And I want you to hear this. Everybody hearing this, everybody watching, listen to this very carefully. What we as a church have done, because we're focused on do's and don'ts, we have made temptation all about sin. And we've elevated the violation of, of whatever it is we violated to sin. We've made it about the sin. You know what it's about in the spiritual realm? It's not at all about, Satan's not about, I got them to sin. I tempted them. They sinned. Oh, that's great. 
I really think Satan could care less about that. You know what his focus is? His focus on the temptation to make you sin is to diminish your God-likeness. Remember Genesis 1.26, we're made in his image and his likeness. He so hates us that he wants to destroy our likeness. That's why he said to Jesus, if you are the son of God. He's messing with his identity. If there's anything that's been happening over these last years in our world and in America, it's people have an identity crisis. They don't know who they are. Satan wants to mess up people's identity. If he can diminish your God-likeness, he can diminish your influence. So get that, please. Please get that. Don't elevate the sin. Elevate the fact that when you do that, I'm not like God. Because God doesn't do that. That's what it's all about. And the church gets so sidelined from that. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a what? A holy nation. Everybody say holy nation. God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you're the God's, God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and ex exiles, abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, and so on. What is Peter doing here? He's telling them who they are before he tells them what to do. You're, you're a holy nation. You're holy people. And because you're that, don't do these things. It's not just don't do these things. No, it's because of who you are. You're holy. You're holy. So you've got to conduct yourselves in a holy manner because God wants to use you in the earth. God wants you to be like him. Isaiah 52, 13. This is a picture of Jesus the Messiah. Watch this. This is so powerful. This is centuries before Jesus ever came to the earth, Isaiah got a picture of the suffering Messiah. What, it was gonna, what was gonna happen to him, what it was gonna be about. And he gives us the most vivid detail, prophetic detail about the Messiah's suffering. Watch this, Isaiah 52, 13. See my servant, that's talking about Jesus, shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him. This is a picture of him on the cross. So marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. Now watch this very carefully. Appearance and form speak to his image. His body was so disfigured from the brutality, from the beating, from the crucifixion, that when you saw him on the cross, you go, who is that? That's Jesus. That can't be Jesus. That doesn't look like Jesus. He was so messed up, so disfigured, the prophet Isaiah saw it in the future. He was more than any other human being. He was... He was his body, his flesh was destroyed. Watch this. Jesus' image, image. What are we made like? We're made in God's image and likeness. His image on the cross was marred more than any other person to the point he was unrecognizable. God allowed the image of man through Christ to be destroyed in order that we might become more like him, his likeness. The church in the Western world has become more concerned with image than likeness. Holiness is not about image. Holiness is about likeness, and that likeness brings power. So I want to leave you with this closing statement. The anointing will change the image part of you. Holiness will change the likeness part of you. You need to, and I need to be more focused on being like God than our image. People see the anointing. God sees the holiness. And that image was destroyed 
so that you, can I, you and I could be forgiven, we could be washed, cleansed, so that you and I could be useful, make a difference, and be like him. At your seat, you have communion elements. I want you to take those. Those of you at home, go to your cupboards, get a cracker, get some juice. We're going to receive Holy Communion together. Thank God for his sacrifice for you and me. Amen. We're going to take a minute and just worship together. I'm going to instruct you about these elements in just a second. And then the worship team is just going to lead us in a segment of worship so that we can receive Holy Communion together. You know, there was a, an old chorus, Pastor Curtis, that we used to sing. I want to be more like you. You guys remember that? That's an old one. I want to be more like you. And then the next part of the song, watch this. I want to be a vessel you work through because I want to be more like you. Yeah, I want to be like him just because he's my father. But I also want to be like him so he can work through me. I'm just a vessel. It's just a vessel. As you peel back that top layer and it, it, to get to the wafer, you hold that in your hands. I'm going to just pray a prayer. And then during the worship, we're not going to go step by step with this. I just want you to receive these elements at your prompting. Just between you and God. Those of you at home, you're not going to get any instructions from me. I'm just going to come over here while they sing. I'm just going to worship and receive. I'm going to thank him for his body and blood. We're going to pray that together. But we want to have a special time in his presence today. Father, thank you for the privilege of worship, the privilege of coming into your presence. Thank you for your body broken for me. Thank you for your blood spilled for me, Lord. As we receive these communion elements today, make us more like you. Make us to be holy people of God, that your power can flow through us. We thank you for Calvary and the sacrifice of it all. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Take a minute and worship him and receive communion.
always holds us close. Amen. We are going to leave here today knowing that he's going to hold on to us. We're going to walk closely with him. Aren't you grateful for that today? Come on, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. You know, I, I, I was during that worship segment, Pastor David, I was thinking, why is God so speaking to us about this subject? Here's what I believe with all my heart. I know you feel this way too. It, it's not as much about, well, he just wants us to be pure and holy. Yes, of course. But I believe God is preparing us as a people for something phenomenal and spectacular for what he's about to do. Amen. Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. Listen, we believe that so much here in leadership. I just want you to know next week, the flow of the service is going to be different. We're going to take that middle MC segment that breaks up the praise and worship from the word. We're removing that out of the service, going to put that at the very end so that we can have a seamless flow from the praise and worship right into the word because we believe that what God is doing and what God is saying is more important than what we're saying. So we're going to take time to listen to him in those segments and let the power of Almighty God move in this place, at people's homes, all over. And I believe, and I was praying, I was up in the middle of the night just praying for you, praying for this service. And I'm praying and crying out to God, God, signs and wonders and miracles by the power of your spirit. Lord, let people experience the true power and the kingdom of God. But listen, we don't know the effects of that unless you tell us. So send us emails, send us information, tell us during the service, God did this or God answered this prayer. God moved in that way. We want to share it so that people be encouraged in their faith. Amen. All right, man. God bless you. Listen, we got to let you go because we got to clean this place to get ready for the next service. The people that are coming in, Keep your eyes on the screen for just a moment for the close, all right? You can remain standing if you want because we're going to get out of here in a second. I hope you have been inspired and blessed by that life-changing message. Do me a favor, click the share button. Share this message. There's so many people outside of Life Source that needs to hear this message. So please, share, share, share. Share the message for all to hear. We're getting ready to do our declarations in a minute, but before we do that, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today for the first time ever, God bless you. We love you. Do me a favor. I need you to go to lifesourcechurches.com. You're going to see a link there that says what's next we want to be with you we want to walk with you we want to pray for you as you continue on this journey with christ you can even send us an email at info at lifesourcechurches.com we can't wait to hear from you as we get ready to do these declarations why do we do these declarations we know that there's power and life in the tongue and we speak nothing but goodness of god over our lives we are blessed children of god and that's how we are blessed coming in and we're blessed going out so as we get ready to leave out of here today we are going to be blessed and we've all i believe we've already been blessed by today's service but i know we're going to be blessed even more as we exit out of the building so do me a favor everyone stand up on your feet even if you're watching online i need you to stand up with me and i need you to raise your right hand with me and i want you to repeat these words after me i want you to speak it with authority i want you to say it out loud i want you to say it like you know that you mean these words and they're being spoken over your life are you ready because here we go all right say this with me say I am saved, I am healed, I am free, I have victory, I have authority, and change is here, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, we love you, we can't wait to see you next time, take care.